Okay, so after reading this chapter, I can safely say that this guy is trash. But we do need to talk about him in depth later on. But for now, hello everyone and welcome to the Enemy Delia. And today, let's talk about chapter 168 of the Ethan Zero manga series. Another sad and emotional chapter that links with the theme of respect. Plus, we also let those who have lost their lives bravely within this war that has just concluded and return those souls to the stars. So then, this ending segment with the lanterns lighting up, illuminating the sky, was beautiful and felt very respectful, which is what the whole point of this tradition was. You light your lantern, and in doing so, you allow the souls of the lost to return to the stars in order to find rest and eternal peace. You do this as a sign of respect for those that you want to think about and keep in your heart and in your memory when moving forward. Now, I love this not just because the artwork was stunningly beautiful or the fact that it was a very respectful in nature when looking at this particular action, but because it links to a real life tradition. I love it whenever an anime or a manga reflects a real life event or tradition as it helps add more realism and more meaning to the actions within the series, allowing me personally to be a bit more immersed in what's being presented. So for that, I do appreciate it. Now then, keeping in line with the theme of respect, Hamora is a character that, is a, that does exactly that. She does something really sweet and wholesome. However, due to circumstances surrounding her actions, it causes more skepticalness aboard Chase's ship and crew members. Hamora sending Creed's body back to the ship was perfectly in line with her character and personality. After all, we just had an emotional send-off for Witch, which was all about the theme of family. And Hamora is obviously big on the idea of family. So the fact that she sent Creed back to his family, so to speak, it just makes sense that Hamora would do so. Plus, this segment also works wonderfully in helping the antagonisticness of Creed's actual killer and former teammate grow. After reading this chapter, my respect for Jesse has dropped massively, to the point where I don't really care a lot about the character. With that being said, however, though, I did enjoy the build-up as it somewhat makes us dislike the character like we're meant to do. After all, he's a member of the good guys, so you would expect him to be rather sort of, you know, upstanding and respectful and, uh, you know, protagonistic-like. But at the moment, he's far from all of those. He has killed his friend and now is covering his tracks because he's scared of getting caught. He's full of fear and in that fear, he makes two fatal mistakes. Error number one, deleting the data sent with the body. Whenever data gets deleted, there is always a trace of it being recorded as, well, deleted. So when someone appears and looks at the data upon what was sent, they're going to find a gap or something missing. Maybe they think that someone's deleted it. And the first person they're going to think of is the first person that went to see the body when it first arrived. That's right, Jesse rushed straight towards the body and, of course, we know that he was the one that deleted it. So, of course, when someone sees that some data has been deleted, it's going to cause alarm bells to start going off. The second fatal error is stating who the killer was in being Hamora. Now, it's not out of the realms of possibility that Hamora would have been the one to kill Creed from an outsider's perspective. However, Victory already knew of the fact that Creed was killed by a single gunshot wound. And Hamora specialises in using her main weapons as swords. So it wouldn't really be fitting for Hamora to suddenly switch it up and use a gun to kill Creed. I think it would have been better for Jesse to have blamed Wise, but here we go. He was panicked, he was rushing, and he made a mistake in fear. 
Now then, the counter argument to this would have been that Jesse didn't know about Victory knowing of the gunshot wound. And that Jesse blamed Hamora because he feels like she seduced him in joining their side and rebelling against justice. Either way, it doesn't change the fact that Jesse is a killer. Ultimately, though, I think that Victory will confront Jesse in the future. Whether Victory kills Jesse because he's already suspicious of something and finds out complete evidence that Jesse is the one that killed Creed, or I think the more likely outcome is that Jesse is going to kill Creed because Jesse gets even more scared, even more agitated and on edge and kills Victory to try and cover himself up even more until eventually justice finds out what has all gone on this entire time and just unleashes his fury upon Jesse, giving us as the audience some justice. Yeah, that works. Now then, the final piece of noteworthy thing from this chapter would be the conversations at the beginning. First and foremost, I want to talk about the character of Feather. After all, her personality within this chapter held the vibe of playfulness and cheekiness, giving us some brilliant facial expressions, and all round just made me love the character a lot when being presented. But going into the conversation itself, this was excellent, as it builds up to our next set of villains. In a way, because it builds up these characters in making them seem threatening, more threatening than anything we faced before. We have the Interstellars calling Elsie Crimson irrelevant at this point. They call her as merely just being powerful, but not really a threat. They don't even mention Ziggy in this conversation. So just from those facts alone, we can tell that these three new characters that were silhouetted and introduced are going to be menacing. More menacing, more powerful, more destructive than anything we've seen from Ziggy and Elsie up to this point. And you know what? That's got me excited. I'm hyped. Let's see it. But who are these new characters? Well, their names and titles are as follows. We have Dead End Crow, the Titan of Eternal Darkness. Bishop Saint Fire Knox. And lastly, God Agnuella, the Mother of Dragons. Now personally, I can't wait to see the Mother of Dragons, as we haven't really been able to explore the idea of these metallic dragons within the series just yet. We only know a small little bit of information about them, and I think when it comes to this character here, and the lore behind these dragons, I feel like it's going to give us lore and world building that is much needed for this series. I have a feeling that every one of these new characters will actually die at some point with Ziggy taking their powers just like he did with Nero. I feel like that is what we're building up to. We're going to hype these characters up, we're going to make them strong and menacing and showcase how brilliant they are before Ziggy comes in and takes all of the spoils, making him the overlord of overlords. Now personally, that's all I've really got to say for this chapter. Overall, I enjoyed it and thought it was a decent chapter that helps progress the story a little tiny bit while still giving our characters the closure that they need to recover from with their big loss in losing Witch. Of course, I want to hear what you thought of this chapter in the comment section down below. Let me know what your thoughts, opinions, theories, whatever you have to say. Hope you enjoyed this review. If you have, hit like, comment, subscribe, all of that good stuff. And above all else, have a great day. Alligator, Martinet, goodbye.